is um, an ash kill that took place 12 million years ago in Nebraska. You want to see something that formed in catastrophic events. This is a catastrophe. An entire herd of rhinoceros were killed in one fell swoop. One of them was pregnant. We've even seen the pregnant, we've seen the products of that pregnancy. Baby rhino. But look at that. That's very unusual. This is a whole environment that was frozen instantly in time when a volcano erupted, one of the giant caldera of Central North America, 12 million years ago. And we can date that from the potassium argon dates of the fossil and of the environment in which it was buried. Now let's go to the next slide. This one died similarly. That's Lucy. She's not 40% complete. She's nearly 80% complete. Unless, of course, you want to believe that uh, you can see somebody who, who's only cut in half and not know what the other half looks like. Let not thy right hand know what thy left hand is doing. Um, you, you know what right and left look like. Well, it's the same thing with Lucy. She's reflexively symmetric. You're bilaterally symmetric, fortunately. The pelvis, the femur, the knee, the feet are adapted for bipedalism. That is, she was a successful, upright walker. Yes, she may have spent some time in the trees. Some of you did when you were kids, too. But this character is no knuckle walker. She couldn't have knuckle walked. Her pelvis is wrong. She couldn't have given birth. Her pelvis is totally wrong. Her knees come in at the wrong angle. They come in at an angle of about 109 degrees. That's totally wrong. To prove this, I challenge any of you to knuckle walk. Um, you may think you're shambling, but believe me, you ain't doing what a chimp can do. Next, next slide, please. The reason I brought up the rhinoceros was this. This is the oldest human footprint. Lucy didn't make this. Some of her contemporaries did, near Lake Rudolph. This was discovered by the same Mary Leakey who successfully discovered Australopithecus robustus. This is the footprint of Australopithecus afarensis slash africanus. It's still not clear which. This is a bipedal footprint. I know it doesn't look like it, but neither does your footprint on the beach, because this is one footprint in a whole trackway of humans who were walking as a group over volcanic ash, just like the ash in central Nebraska, after a volcanic explosion occurred in central Africa. Three and a half million years ago. There is no question that these footprints are older than 2.9 and probably as old as three and a half million years. And I can quote just as well as anybody else. So if you want the references, I will be glad to supply them. This is a bipedal animal. This is our ancestor as a ghost. This is the beginning of humanity. Next slide. Dr. Gish presented you with an example of a pteranodon. Well, here's a pterosaur that has teeth. I think you'll notice that the teeth are very weak, but they are there. Um, this is a pure reptile. Nobody would question that. Next slide. This is also one which was originally called a reptile. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that it looks almost as if this booger went splat on a piece of plaster of Paris. It's got a tail, it's got teeth, claws. This is Archaeopteryx. Those are the impressions of the feathers. This is the original fossil. I show it because when it was first found, it was misclassified as a reptile. 
If that doesn't tell you that this thing is a transitional form, I don't know what does. Because if a competent anatomist could look at this and say, this thing is more characteristic of a reptile, and then only years later notice, wait a minute, those are feathers, which are not exactly like a normal bird, then that must be an example. The reason we keep pointing it out is that this little booger is so dramatic. Look at it. It was laid down in the sandstone. It's one of the best, most beautifully preserved examples we have. Now, there are six or seven others of them. I should add the fact that the very fact that there are multiple fossils is the other reason we pointed out. If it were only one, we wouldn't care. And that's why Piltdown and Nebraska Man were always trouble. Nebraska Man may have made the front page of the London News, but I remind you, so did Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> Um, not only that, but uh, so did the abominable snowman and Bigfoot at various times. The fact that it makes the headlines of the London Evening News or the National Enquirer doesn't make it real. Most scientists didn't accept Hesperopithecus, Nebraska man, and none of them took that reconstruction seriously, except maybe Dr. Gish's colleagues. Piltdown was always a problem because there was only one, and it was exposed by an evolutionist at the British Museum, a specialist on hominid evolution who recognized that, number one, there was something wrong. It was too perfect. And number two, its dating was wrong. It couldn't possibly fit in the human sequence. There must have been something wrong. Not that it was too perfect. It was dead perfect. Everybody expected that our ancestors would look like that sort of an OSU quarterback. But the fact is that like Neanderthal, if you saw one of those characters coming toward you, I guarantee you drop the ball and run. <laughs> they didn't look human. They didn't look like us. The brow ridges were different. They were not ordinary Homo sapiens sapiens. They were Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. And that's a difference. Let's see what the next slide is. Okay, um, I think this is a happy little booger to end on. Uh, this is a trilobite, a trilobite. There are thousands of these characters. When I was um, knee-high to a cockroach and growing up at Stony Brook as a beginning graduate student, um, I spent a lot of time hanging around the trilobite lab uh, just because there were so many different kinds of these things. And I bring this up because I want to end on a very simple question, which we're going to address later. What do we mean by kinds? When we say species, we know what that means. Dr. Gish used the word rather loosely, and I ask you to think about what that means. This isn't just sophistry. Science is in part a common language. It's an attempt to understand things in terms of definable, realistic language which can be universally understood, not by a brotherhood of priests and pointy hats and crystal balls, but by you. Part of it is breaking through the jargon and getting you to understand the structure that builds all of this. I'll end on this point. For now, my formal training is in astronomy. But I hope that by showing you, and, and I've taught geophysics and mathematics and history and philosophy of science, I have a lot of hobbies, but I will point something out. I hope you'll recognize that I'm not just trying to mouth off thousands of examples to you. I'm trying to give you a feeling for the way in which the integrative structure is constructed. This isn't a building without foundations. When we see the tips of those leaves and the tips of those branches, we know that an oak or a maple lies inside of it. We may not see that, but if you see the tips, you know there's a tree. You do know there's a tree. And part of our aim is to elucidate what that tree is and see if we can learn something new from it. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your cooperation for the first section of our debate tonight. We're going to take a 15-minute intermission at this time. There will be refreshments in the back, and if you didn't get a survey, you can get that at this time. We will begin in 15 minutes with the first rebuttal, a 15-minute rebuttal by Dr. Dwayne Gish. Thank you very much. I'd like to point out, first of all, that the age of things, time, is not an issue here this evening. So as concerning the age of things, there are theologians, there are creation scientists who do believe and accept the idea that the earth is very old. They are called progressive creationists. There are other creations who believe that things are quite young, that there's much evidence to indicate and to support the idea that the age of the universe, the age of the earth, is much, much younger than suggested by evolutionists. So there's a difference of opinion on this point. So that's not the issue. We're not here to debate the age or time, but how did this universe come into existence? I just want to uh, point out, however, there's an interesting article that appeared in the November 27th, 1982 issue of Science News, which these scientists are talking about uh, the grand unified monopoles and grand unified theories and all of this. Now, I, I have to say, I really don't understand much of this. Maybe uh, Dr. Shore understands more about it than I do. But uh, <laughs> they're, quoting Alan, they're quoting Alan Guth, Michael Turner, Michael Turner, University of Chicago, Alan Guth, and others, uh, or Guth of the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's interesting here. Speculation, I, I have to admit this is speculation. But they're talking about the, the GUM, GUM, Grand Unified uh, Monopole. And this, now listen to this. this uh, Michael Turner says that thermally, their cooling power would bring the universe to its present temperature of three Kelvins in 10,000 years. That would make creationists happy, Turner says, but would seriously dismay evolutionary biologists, paleontologists, and geologists. And then Alan Guth, well, he, he estimates that it would take 38,400 years to get to the present state of the universe through a system of this kind. Here are these people, astronomers, evolutionists, speculating. And that's all this is, just speculation. I don't care what you're talking about, it's speculation. That's what uh, Dr. Shore has been doing here all evening, showing all those slides of, of galaxies and stars and things like that. What did he show us? things that are running down and deteriorating. Clusters of galaxies are dispersing. Stars are exhausting their fuel. What's a supernova? It's an explosion. The star rapidly goes towards disorder. That's all that we've seen here tonight is disorder. It's speculating, you see, it's taking that and then taking this evidence now for deterioration and decay and trying to overlay that with some theory about origins. I don't quite understand how can you take all this evidence for everything that's running down and decaying, going to death, and then get some theory of origins out of it? But it's interesting that what these people are saying, their speculations, it, well, you could create the universe in 10,000 years in that way. Now, Dr. Shore said uh, something about the universe running down. I'm not quite sure what he meant by that. But let me quote what a couple of evolutionary astronomers have said, George Gamow, in his book, The Creation Universe, says, we may also assume that in the distant past, our universe was considerably less differentiated and complex than it is now, and that the state of matter at that time could be accurately described by the classical concept of primordial chaos. And then Victor Weisskopf, he said, this evolutionary history of the world from the Big Bang to the present universe is a series of gradual steps from the simple to the complicated, from the unordered to the organized, from the formless gas of elementary particles to the morphic atoms and molecules, and further to the still more structured liquids and solids, and finally to the sophisticated living organisms. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is not running down. That's not following the second law of thermodynamics, as Dr. Shore has suggested. Not at all. Why, of course. If that cosmic egg had exploded, and all we ever got out of it was this hydrogen gas that just expanded forever, well, there'd be no problem with the second law of thermodynamics. 
Who'd ever heard of the second law of thermodynamics anyhow? It wouldn't be anything but hydrogen gas in the entire universe. There's no problem, you see, with that. If the universe exploded and expanded and cooled down forever, and that's all that happened, sure, no problem with the second law of thermodynamics, but that's not what happened. We have a hundred billion galaxies. There's a hundred billion stars in every galaxy. That's a hundred billion times a hundred billion stars, and every star represents a very complicated system where we have an incredibly high temperature. It's not cold inside of a star. It's very hot. So somehow out of hydrogen gas, 100 billion times 100 billion times, things had to form and get very hot. That's not running down, that's not deteriorating. Now here I have an article. It's by Ben Petrusky in Science 81, June, and uh, he quotes IBM's Philip Seiden. Now Dr. Shore doesn't like this quoting business, but these people have done their research. This is the results of their research. Dr. Seiden said the standard Big Bang model does not give rise to lumpiness. That model assumes that the universe start out as a globally smooth, homogeneous, expanding gas. If you apply the laws of physics to this model, you get a universe that is uniform. A cosmic vastness of evenly distributed atoms with no organization of any kind. No galaxies, no stars, no planets, no nothing. You don't get it that way, and you can't get it that way if you take the laws of science and apply it to this model. Here's an article by Fred Hoyle, The Big Bang in Astronomy, which appeared in New Scientist, 19th November, 1981, page 521. He says, talking about this initial flash, you know, the Big Bang, he says, but the interesting quark transformations are almost immediately over and done with, to be followed by a little rather simple nuclear physics, to be followed by what? By a dull as ditch water expansion which degrades itself adi adiabatically, adiabatically until it is incapable of doing anything at all. The notion that galaxies form to be followed by an active astronomical history is an illusion. Nothing forms. The thing is as dead as a doornail. And a little later in the article, he says, the punchline is that even though outward speeds, that is, you have this explosion and you have this radial motion, material going out in a radial motion, he says the punchline is that even though outward speeds are maintained in a free explosion, internal motions are not. Internal motions die away adiabatically and the expanding system becomes inert which is exactly why the Big Bang cosmologies lead to a universe that is dead and done with almost from the beginning. Now, Dr. Shore says you have the, a fluctuation, if, he says, you had a fluctuation big enough. Well, now, please note that Hoyle says you have this radial motion, and then you, if you had any fluctuation, they die away. They are eliminated very rapidly. And Dr. Shore says, if you had a fluctuation, now, ladies and gentlemen, if you get matter going in motion, if you do that, you've got to have an adequate cause. You just can't have a fluctuations on a massive scale appear out of nowhere. What's going to move that untold billions of tons of matter in such a motion? Everything in the universe, as a matter of fact, is rotating. Practically everything is rotating. Our solar system is rotating. Stars rotate. Galaxies rotate. Clusters of galaxies rotate but yet the explosion would have thrown everything out into a radial motion. Now, if you get things rotating, you've got to have an adequate cause. And there is no such cause, as Hoyle has said. There is no way we are going to get this universe that we have today by any such big bang. Now, a cloud of gas to form a star by collapsing on itself, that will never happen. No cloud of gas can collapse on itself and form a star. Oh, there is gravitational attraction. There is no doubt about it. Every particle attracts every other particle. But when that cloud of gas, whatever made it start to collapse, who knows? If that cloud of gas began to collapse on itself, then it heats up. It gets hot. Now you've got two forces at work. You've got gravitational force pulling in. You've got gas pressure pushing out. The gas pressure pushing out exceeds the gravitational force pulling in by 50 to 100 times. 
that cloud will never collapse on itself because the gas pressure pushing out is much greater than the gravitational force pulling in. You'll never get a star, never, without some outside help. As a matter of fact, A.G.W. Cameron, in an article a few years ago, suggested maybe there was a supernova nearby that gave the push or some interstellar magnetic process. Well, ladies and gentlemen, to have a supernova, you've got to have a star. And so you have to have a star to make a star. And that doesn't tell us how stars ever got started in the first place, does it? What Dr. Cameron was admitting is that the star will never form spontaneously. It's got to have some outside push. Now, as far as Dr. Shore's comments on probability, those remarks were absolutely worthless. I mean, he said nothing. I mean, if you actually... Fred Hoyle and Chandrawick Ramasinghe, as well as many others, Hubert Yockey, Journal of Theoretical Biology, uh, Frank Salisbury in Nature and others have published the results of their calculations that shows beyond doubt the probability of these events are nil. They'll never form. It'll never happen. Now, he said that Wick Ramasinghe idea that this was evidence for God was not scientific. Do you know what Wick Ramasinghe said, Professor Wick Ramasinghe said, and I heard him say it. He said, this evidence is empirical evidence for the existence of God. He maintained it was actually empirical evidence for the existence of God. Because, you see, if you can establish beyond a shadow of a doubt, absolutely no question about it, that this universe could not have created itself naturally, that life could not have arisen spontaneously by natural processes, what else is there? If it couldn't have formed naturally, it had to form or had to be created supernaturally. And so it was a very logical, reasonable, scientific conclusion. Now, I have just a few minutes, but I want to say about just a few words about the fossil record. Oh, we have a few examples, suggested examples. Archaeopteryx, we think, we think is a terrible, terrible example. We ought to have ten thousands, thousands of undoubted transitional forms. I couldn't question them. I couldn't doubt them. You see, if evolution was true, I wouldn't question the fact of evolution. We ought to have thousands and thousands of undoubted transition forms, but we always keep coming back to Ar Archaeopteryx. Every generation always has its evolutionary story. Derek Ager, Professor Ager, Professor of Geology at Swansea in Wales, he, he's an evolutionist to the core. He has no use for creationists. In an article he published in the Proceedings Geological Association in 1976, it was his presidential address, address to that society or association, he said this, now, he doesn't believe in slow and gradual evolution, by the way. He believes he, he must be some sort of catastrophic evolution or jerky evolution. He says it must be significant that nearly all the evolutionary stories I learned as a student have now been debunked. Similarly, my own experiences of more than 20 years looking for evolutionary lineages among the Mesozoic Brachiopoda has proved them equally elusive. Now, you see what, do what Dr. Ager is saying? He learned a lot of stories, a lot of beautiful illustrations about evolution when he's a student, and practically all of them have been debunked today. And that is the case time after time after time. Beautiful stories, they look good, they look plausible, but with the passage of time, they eventually get debunked. And Archaeopteryx is in the process of getting debunked right now. We have found, or it is reported, they found a fossil bird. Undoubted, they said, they believed it could be a, an undoubted modern bird in rocks as old as those that contain Archaeopteryx, rocks of the Upper Jurassic. That's, according to that then, modern birds and Archaeopteryx were contemporaries. And evolutionists have always maintained if you have two contemporaries, they, one cannot be the ancestor of the other. They had to evolve from a common ancestor. And it, other evidence is accumulating. I have an article here about Archaeopteryx, published in Nature, 18th of September, 1983. And uh, one fellow here by the uh, name of Whetstone, who has taken a closer look now at the skull of Archaeopteryx. And in contrary to earlier reports, he says that this study has shown that the skull is much broader and more bird-like than had been thought. 
He says, details of the brain case and associated bones at the back of the skull seem to suggest that Archaeopteryx is not the ancestral bird. And as a matter of fact, in this article, the, the article says that evolutionists have three different ideas about Archaeopteryx. Maybe it evolved from a dinosaur, maybe it evolved from a thecodont reptile, and maybe it even evolved from a crocodile. And nobody agrees. Well, we think the evidence clearly indicates that Archaeopteryx was simply a bird, and there's much other uh, documentation I could provide for that. But ladies and gentlemen, I just think that as we look at all of this evidence, and I have to say all we can do is try to to judge or try to say, now, which one of these explanations, creation or evolution, seems to be more credible? When you do that, when you take all of the weight of the evidence on the fossil record and all of these other areas of science, I am convinced as a science that this evidence not only supports creation, it demands creation and exposes fatal fallacies in evolutionary theory. Thank you. Here goes Rocky, too. Um, this won't be dueling slide trays, so don't worry. First of all, I resent the fact that a collaborator of mine was quoted here out of context. I work with Phil Seiden. He's at IBM. He works on galaxy models. He and I have been working together for three years now. You quoted him out of context, Dr. Gish. Totally. Second, you are quite right. I think I do understand gut cosmologies a little better than you do. Um, to the extent that Mike Turner and Al Gutt are completely right, if there were one free monopole in the universe, the universe could indeed cool at that rate. Unfortunately, there are no free monopoles. That's a real problem. Um, because monopoles, according to the grand unified theories, do not exist in free form. If one did, then I would be the first one to worry about why it is that the universe appears to be 10 billion years old from every other line of evidence, and yet the monopole tells us that everything could cool in 10,000 years. I would be very perturbed, and I'd learn something from it. I've spent a lot of time on cosmology in the last five years. It's one of my fields. I've also worked quite a bit on the problem of the formation of stars. And another thing that Dr. Gish pointed out is completely incorrect. The mass that you get for a star when you collapse it down from a diffuse cloud of gas and dust is determined by the point at which the pressure winds up being in equilibrium. And if you had quoted Dr. Cameron's work, which was reported this summer at Lazouche, among other places, where I spent a month working on the problem of star formation, you would know that the calculations go back to 1913 by James Jeans and originally show what's called the genes mass, which is the mass allowable for a star at which the mass of gas is supported completely against gravitation by the internal magnetic fields plus pressure. And that, Dr. Gish, turns out to be between 0.1 and 10 solar masses. In the core of the constellation Orion, there is an object called IRC2. You've heard of this one from our last debate. IRC2 is a star which is forming. May I please have that batch of slides that uh, were all the way coupled in the back? Because something that your tax dollars were very, very gratefully received by us um, as having helped with, I'd like to get back to you. A couple of years ago, a group of scientists gave actually five years of their lives to build a satellite called IRAS. You may have heard of it, the Infrared Astronomical Satellite. Um, it died about two months ago. We think of these almost as people, and that's the way I'm beginning to think of space telescope. But when it died, it left us with a legacy of over 200,000 new objects to catalog. This is what a region of star formation in the infrared looks like. This is Orion if you were IRAS. 
the gas and dust you're seeing here, could you focus that please, has a temperature which is so cold that you would find it hard to conceive of it. It's about 30 Kelvin, 30 degrees above absolute zero. So right here, that's a cluster. And that cluster is still forming. We've seen it now. Yours is the first generation to see it. We've speculated about this. Our theories indicated that it must be true, but there it is, a photograph. And five years from now, when Space Telescope is launched, we're going to look back at that. And we know it will have changed. We even know the way it'll have changed, because that's a star forming, a real star, not some contradiction that Dr. Gish appears to be presenting to you. And one other point. Inside that core, there are processes that we're only now beginning to understand. What I'd like you to capture is the fact that we aren't saying we have all the answers. We want to learn. We're desperate to learn because the universe is so big and our life is so short. Without IRAS, without this photograph, we would probably still be open, not legitimately being a theoretician, but I will say that there are those who would say that we could be open to the charge of speculating. That's not speculation anymore. Now, Dr. Gish, the last time I brought up IRC2, brought up the point that that was nothing more than hot balls of gas and dust. Am I correct, sir, or am I quoting you out of context? Did you say that all we see, <laughs> did you say that all we see are hot clouds of gas and dust and that we've never seen a star form? All we see is the hot gas. That's correct. Sir, what is a star but a ball of hot gas that's self-gravitating? Uh, Nothing, sir, except that there's a nuclear reaction going on in the core, and in those stars, they're so young that that reaction hasn't even started. When I was a child, I dreamed of being able to say that. <laughs> I dreamed of seeing that moment. I was in an audience of scientists this summer. This is purely anecdotal, but I don't mind wasting my time if you don't think it's wasted. There were 50 of us who had been chosen from all over the world. We were all, mo all interested in the question of star formation. Most of us were observers. I happened to be one of the few local theorists. Japanese, Indian, Chinese, English, French. I remember, and I will never forget, the, that in mid-August during the school, in the middle of the Alps, isolated from everybody, Hans Habing got up, the head of the IRAS team, and started to give the series of lectures that he was going to give, presenting results that were preliminary to publication. I sat in a room of scientists who spanned an entire generation, those who were of Hoyle's generation, those who were of mine. There wasn't a sound in that room. I've never seen something like this. You couldn't even hear the pen scratching. No one got up to leave a half hour after it was all over. And as soon as Hobbing put that photograph and several others like it down on the table and the group was finished, we descended on that like hungry locusts because we had always known that that's what we would see. And it was seen. That's what science is. Not one of the results that Dr. Gish has quoted to you is by a creation scientist. Not one! Thank you.
Dr. Shore said there's no longer any speculation here. We have it right in front of our eyes. We see a star form. Ladies, that's absolute nonsense. What did he show you? A picture of a cloud of gas. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what he showed you was a cloud of gas in Orion, which he said was at what? 30 Kelvin. That's 30 degrees from absolute zero. He says, what, I mean, what is a star but just a cloud of gas? A star in the interior of a star, it's heated at millions of degrees. Now, let me tell you, there's a tremendous difference between a cold cloud of dispersed gas and dust, and that's extremely dispersed. Nothing like a star at all. You take a huge cloud of gas like that, dust. Now, they assume that it's going to form a star. Now, Dr. Shore wants you to wait around, and you just wait around till you see it. Well, you just wait around till you see it. That's okay. <laughs> it's all right. Wait around a few million years, and you still won't see a star form. Nobody's ever seen a star form. Don't let anybody kid you. Nobody has ever seen a star form. Dr. Shore thinks that cloud of gas is going to form a star. He just thinks that, and he speculates it. But if you take the physics and apply the physics to that, take a cloud of gas... 30 degrees Kelvin, spread maybe a one light year in diameter, six trillion miles, and have it start to collapse. And if you just calculate now, as it, as it warms up, it's not going to stay at 30 degrees Kelvin. It's got to warm up, got to get hot, you see. That means there's a lot of gas pressure pushing out. And there is not enough gravitational attraction to overcome that gas pressure. Professor Slusher at the University of Texas, El Paso, has given this problem to his students, to his physics students, every year. He doesn't tell them which, what kind of an answer they ought to get. He doesn't tell them anything like that. Just these physics students there calculate the gas pressure pushing out and the gravitational force pulling in. And every year, without fail, every student comes up with the answer the gas pressure pushing out is 50 to 100 times greater than the gravitational force pulling in. You will never get a star under any such circumstances. Never. You cannot do it. That is pure speculation and nothing else. Now, Dr. Shore wondered how species could form r rapidly. Well, let me just point out, ladies and gentlemen, I think they could form quite rapidly under the right circumstances. I have here something taken from Parade Magazine just recently. It shows a couple in Britain. One is a woman whose father was a black Nigerian, mother was white, and the fellow was white. They had twins, twin boys. One is blonde, blue-eyed, and white, as white can be. The other is black, dark hair. Now here you got black and white, not only in one generation, but from one, very, one couple. If you have the right genetic mix, I mean, there's no problem at all at getting this variety very, very rapidly. Now, I, I've just run out of things to, to rebut here because Dr. Shore just hasn't offered enough to... <laughs> I, so, what I think we have seen here, ladies and gentlemen, see tonight is a, a display of a tremendous amount of speculation and thinking. That's all. I, don't, I wouldn't deny Dr. Shore the right to speculate forever. But to call that science, that's what I think is so dead wrong, and to insist that our students and our tax-paid schools be exposed to that sort of speculation and deny them the right to hear the good, solid scientific evidence that supports creation, I think that is terribly wrong. What we are pleading for, ladies and gentlemen, is not to get evolution out of the school. Anybody has a right to believe in evolution and teach it. But what we want is fairness. We want academic and religious freedoms reestablished in our schools. And I, I agree, I agree. Whatever you agree or don't agree about his politics, I will say this, I agree with President Reagan, we ought to get God back in the classroom, at least as our creator. Thank you.
I agree with academic freedom. I like it. I live my life by it. Um, now we get to the core of this business. I'm glad you brought it up, Dr. Gish. It really is political. We're not debating science. Don't, don't get the wrong idea. All, all that you've done, sir, is to deny my evidence. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry you don't understand it. You see, um, I gave some OSU students the same problem and they came up with the sun. Um, the only problem is that they were third year students, so they knew some calculus. Um, what surprises me is that I've never given that problem, because I did in my 221-222 class, which is junior and sophomore level astrophysics that I teach at Case. Um, I've given problems like that all the times I've taught the course. For some reason, none of the students ever came up with a different answer, although their numbers always differed. None of them ever came up with the result that it was impossible. Because I encourage my students, if they get an answer which doesn't agree with what I've said in class, to give it in. It happens that during a lecture a couple of years ago, I discovered a mathematical theorem that way. Um, and I don't mean my students did. I mean, I was trying to explain something to them. Again, that's the way science works. Now, I'm going to get political here. Um, I have a theory. This isn't speculation, this is theory. I can drop this box and there are demons in the center of the earth who love plastic, okay? Now, there are slides in this box, so maybe they like the slides, but I can drop this and every time, you can make a firm scientific prediction, even a, a creation scientist can, that it's going to fall and I can calculate that it'll fall as the inverse square. Therefore, I should teach my students that there are the alternative to Newtonian gravitation is that there are demons in the center of the Earth who eat plastic. <laughs> now, we have a problem here. We drop leather and the leather falls, so they also like leather, but maybe they're going after the credit cards. Now, my point is what you're talking about is complete anarchy. There's a difference between speculation and knowledge. I may not be giving all of the details of what I've done, but if any of you would like, you can have reprints of my papers, you can see it in the open literature. I will be glad to show you the details of the calculations that I've done. And if you think the calculations are mere speculation, then you don't know where nuclear power came from, you don't know where our understanding of electricity came from, you don't know why your car works. In other words, if you think that theory is useless, idle speculation, then you're denying the modern world. The same <laughs> idle, useless speculation that gave rise to the nuclear processes and the core of a star make that camera work because the quantum mechanics that was needed to understand why the area around a star is 30 degrees and why when we see that 30 degree cocoon, it's because it's so thick that we're not seeing the five and six thousand degree object inside directly. That we can calculate. Because, Dr. Gish, if you see a nuclear explosion on the surface of the Earth through the Earth's atmosphere from the moon, you will not see the 10 million degrees that are reached in the core of the explosion. You'll only see a 5,000 degree shock wave moving out. When we see the supernova explosion, we know the core is forming a complex structure of a neutron star, although we don't see it until the veil that surrounds it is lifted by the explosion. I am asking you to wait a few years. I'm willing to. I'm joining Space Telescope for precisely that reason. I'm giving up my career to follow in the footsteps of those who are serving the astronomical community because I'd like to help give something back to all of you. I would like to show you how beautiful the world as I see it is. That's all. I'm not trying to impose a political order on you. I'm trying to say that what one should teach 
What one should learn is what one knows, and that creation science is mere speculation. It is not science and should not be taught as such. And anything else doesn't matter. Thank you. If there's a break at any point from the origin of life to man, there's an absolute break, then evolution is impossible. Man couldn't get here. Quite obviously, it had to be a continuum. Now, there's absolutely no question that there are no transitional forms between the invertebrates and fish. No one has ever found such a thing. As far as the fossil record is concerned, fish just pop into existence fully formed. In other words, there's no transitional form between any of the phyla, the invertebrate phyla, and the chordate phyla. Now, how do you account for that? Now, you must imagine them an evolutionary continuum, absolutely. There's supposedly 100 million years of evolution there, but not a single indication. As far as the fossil record is concerned, there's ever any such transition. How do you account for that? Where are those transitional forms? Why don't we find them? And so forth. I disagree with your axiom. It doesn't necessarily have to be continuous. Some processes can happen slowly, some quickly. What you call jerky evolution, which some people call punctuated equilibrium, is nothing more than the fact that in small populations, large fluctuations can make a very big difference. If somebody in this room had two heads, it would be and then got isolated, maybe breeding with somebody else who by chance had two heads, you might have a successful <laughs> two-headed form. Maybe. Obviously, that's nonsense. Just because I've deliberately chosen a hyperbole doesn't render the mechanism nonsense. Small populations produce large divergence quickly. Anyone who has ever studied both genetic variations and disease mechanisms understands that. Well, Dr. Shore, I don't believe you understand what punctuated equilibrium is all about. That theory was suggested to explain why there are no transitional forms between species. The difference between a jellyfish or a sponge or a trilobite and a fish is vastly greater than the differences between species. They are in separate classes. There's a monumental gap, a vast chasm between the two. You can't use punctuated equilibrium to explain that. You might use punctuated equilibrium to explain why we don't have transitional forms between various species of clams or, or uh, pigeons or something like that, or, but you're never going to be able to explain, use that theory to explain that vast chasm. There's a, there's a hundred million year gap there on the evolutionary time scale. Uh, Dr. Gish, do you know any example of a genus or a phylum which is represented by a single species? Uh, oh. Do you know any example of a genus which is represented by a single species? Yes. Therefore, if you do, is it not possible that the punctuation of a single species can produce large divergence within the genera and therefore, and I've done the, I did these calculations about four days ago, I have a computer program that generates these fluctuations. Um, if any of you want to run it on your apples, let me know, I'll send it to you. Anyway, the point that I'm getting at is that if you can have the fluctuation between a single species genus or a single genus phylum, then you can get very rapid divergence if the selection mechanisms are favorable. Therefore, in some cases like Archaeopteryx, where there were large populations and little predation pressure, you may very well see a few transitional forms. In the case of, for example, the Devonian fish, I would be very surprised if once predation were possible, the bony fish would not be the ones to survive, and the ones without the bony plates would be the ones to survive. Um, people tend to eat soft-shelled crabs, and so do fish and other predators. And on that note, we're going to have to hold on that question. Okay. okay. Balls Doc in my court? Dr. Shorey. What's the age of the Earth, Dr. Gish? There, as far as Wait, the age of the Earth is concerned... Let, let me finish. Now, let me, I let would me like answer. your statement. You've asked your question. Okay. Scientifically, it's impossible to actually determine the age of the Earth. There are time clocks, indicators, which, if all the assumptions you use in your system is valid, you can estimate an age for the Earth. Using radiometric dating systems, 
using all of the assumptions in those dating systems and throwing out all the dates that don't agree with your assumptions and finagling a lot of other data, you come up with some very old ages. There is a wealth of time clocks that give a young age for the Earth and for the universe. And they also include assumptions. But of course, you only have to extrapolate back a few thousand years, not billions of years. So that should be more reliable. So I would say this. The age of the Earth is equivocal. I'm inclined to accept a young age for the Earth. But I am not going to sit here dogmatically and say that I can prove scientifically one way or the other. And I think it's wrong for you to sit there and say that you can prove dogmatically that the Earth is very old. I too can believe six impossible things before breakfast, to quote the looking glass world. But what I will point out is the fact that you have managed to not state your basic premises. You've just accused most geochemists of dating material by throwing out anything they find discordant. You know full well that's not true. The second statement that I should make is that there are five different major nuclear cosmochronometers, material that can be used not only for meteorites, but also from the interstellar medium. Specifically, things like rubidium, osmium, uranium, Potassium, all of those give consistent lower limits to the age of the Earth of greater than three billion years. My own department, when I was an adjunct in it, the geology department at Case, has several people who are doing both isotope fractionation, which is the way in which you can determine whether the species of rock has been altered, and also potassium argon dating. And in all cases, with the single exception of perhaps the carbon-14 dates for clams that your institute has quoted. Clams are bottom feeders, and therefore you cannot use them as an indication of the carbon-14 age. All available evidence indicates that the universe, at least the Earth, is at least three billion years old, including the surface of the moon on which a little guy from Ohio once tread. Trod. Trod. I'm a scientist, not a grammarian, but thank you. Well, Dr. Shore, I think we have to be a little cautious about this. After all, the volcanic rock off the coast of Hawaii, which erupted in 1800, known to be less than 200 years, but dated it from 22 million to 160 million years by the potassium argon method. Uh huh. I have. But the other rocks weren't, sir. I have an article in my hand published in Science in 1983, volume 220, on the age of the Sunnyvale human skeleton. Listen to what it says. A morphologically modern human skeleton from Sunnyvale, California, previously dated by aspartic acid racemization to be approximately 70,000 years old, and by uranium series isotopic ratios to be 8,300 to 9,000 years old, appears to be younger when dated by carbon-14 method in the range of 3,500 to 5,000 years old. So we have three ages, 3,500 to 5,000 by carbon-14, 8,300 to 9,000 years by the uranium series, and by the amino acid racemization, 70,000 years. Now, Dr. Shore, tell me, how old is that skeleton? Probably 3,000 years. About 3,000 years? or younger. The carbon-14, depending upon the condition of that particular skeleton, may very well have only been 10 years. I'm not talking about single skeletons, sir. A single swallow does not a summer make, and a single discordant date, or even a few in a sample of thousands, doesn't necessarily teach you anything but that you should be careful. Yes, that's right. And I say further, <laughs> I'll say further, that a few concordant dates out of thousands would also tend to make us a little bit cautious, too. A little cautious. Maybe. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I like to think I am being reasonably cautious, especially since I've played around with, for example, the Allende meteorite, which is the one that gives the oldest date. Um, I think that you should point out, of course, uh, that the rest of the Hawaiian island chain has been dated 
and it does indeed come out to be between uh, 10 and 20 million years, and also that the dates are in complete agreement with the direction of motion of the plate on which the Pacific rides, as determined from direct measurement of the magnetic field variations. Um, I think you should also mention that Dr. Shore, ages... thank you very much. Can I interrupt here? I oh, know the, the, okay. we are debating whether the Earth is old or young. We just ran out of time on that question. So, um, well, it's just that Dr. Gish had asserted that this was totally immaterial to the argument, and okay. I think people should be aware of the but, fact that Dr. it's not. Dr. Shore, you were the one that set the time limit on our answers here Fine. tonight. Okay. You, I you didn't do that. You have an extra minute, sir. <laughs> okay. I will be glad, in fact, to let Dr. Gish have the next two questions. Well, we'll just give him, we'll just give him one. Is it my turn now? It's your turn. Okay. You're going to have to keep me track. Dr. Shore, according to what you've told us tonight, you've showed some slides of fossil al algae. These are single-cell microscopic organisms that you said were found in a gun gunflint chert. I believe both be somewhere between two and three billion years old. Then we have the Cambrian animals. They're very, very complex creatures, as you would acknowledge. Trilobites and jellyfish and sponges. Uh, these are incredibly complex creatures. Why is it that we have no transition form between the microscopic single-celled stage of evolution and these very complex animals that appear in Cambrian rocks? explosively. We do. I suggest you look at um, the December 1982 Scientific American, the discussion of North Pole, uh, Australia, in which the Endochian formation is shown. What did they find? What did they find? The Something intermediate between a single cell organism and say a sponge or uh, yeah, a single cell and a trilobite? Well, what is a sponge except for a multi-celled organism in a small colony? The point These, that you, you have this wonderfully discreet view of the world in which everything is put into a series of pigeonholes, or shall I say Linnaean species holes. Um, the world doesn't operate necessarily by zip codes. As people are finding, you have to add intermediate forms among the postal zones. And it's the same thing when you look in the Endochian rocks. If two single-celled organisms are together and form a symbiotic relationship, do you call that one multi-cell organism or two single-celled organisms? Where's the transition there, sir? That's what I'm asking you, Dr. Shore. You're trying to get around to answering the question. I, I want to know, that there where are, are the intermediates? You're doing a lot of talking, but you're not giving us any answers. Uh, Dr. Gish, you showed a very good example of one. It's called an animal cell. That is a perfect example of a symbiotic relationship which became fused in time. As you know, Margolis has demonstrated that in the origin of eukaryotic cells, it is in fact a symbiont relationship between the mitochondria and the nucleole, which can explain and in fact predict many of the properties of the cell. Now, if you would like other examples, I can simply point out the fact that eukaryotes and prokaryotes are, in fact, different orders of complexity, and it isn't very far to go from an algal colony to a sponge, except linguistically. Dr. Shore, I don't think I'm avoiding it. Dr. Shore, you're still not answering the question. These organisms you're talking about is sing are single-cell organisms, and Margoliash, by the way, has not demonstrated any such thing. She has speculated. But there, uh, half of the scientists probably in this world disagrees with her uh, speculations on that idea. But it's still a single cell organism. I want to know, where's the ancestor of the sponges? Where are the ancestors of trilobites? Where are the ancestors of the starfishes? Where are the answers, ancestors of these creatures? They just, here they are, all of a sudden they pop into existence, fully formed. That's a beautiful assertion. I don't have the slides. I suggest that people take a look at the book by Dot and Batten called The Evolution of the Earth. I have limited resources, I have to teach, and so sometimes I don't get a chance to make these slides up. But I will tell you. Well. Okay, you think I'm avoiding the issue. Fine, I'm sorry. 
But there is no difference between the structure that you see in a hydra and a single-celled organism, except that it's several cells that are working together. You can demonstrate that by separating these. Dr. Shore, there are no transition points. Why don't you just come out and say, there aren't any, you don't know why there aren't any, and that's it. I will say this. I mean, we could sit here all night uh, and talk Dish, about it. It's not going to change the facts. I'll come out and say this. There are no transitional forms that you will accept. May I point out, ladies and gentlemen, he still has not answered my question. Okay. Well, thank, thank, you, very, <laughs> thank you very much on your comments on that uh, wonderful issue there. I wonder... Dr. Shore, I believe the ball's back in your court. Um, if Dr. Gish would like, he can make another point. Okay. Um, then, then netball. Um, Dr. Gish, uh, was there a flood? And is the origin of the fossil record <clears throat> consistent with a global aqueous catastrophe or not? Was there a flood? I think there is much evidence for such a flood and a, a catastrophe on a, a vast scale. Now, you know, it's an astounding thing, is it not, ladies and gentlemen, that Mars has not one drop of liquid water, not one drop. But evolutionists have suggested that, at one time at least, that the major features on Mars, many of the major, major features on Mars could have formed by a vast flood, and there's not one drop of water on Mars. But here on Earth, where we have 350 million cubic miles of water, they would deny to the death that there was any possible uh, possibility of a great flood. Well, that seems illogical to me. I could, I could point out many evidences of such a catastrophe. Go Vast ahead. fossil graveyards. The Colorado Plateau, 200,000 square miles of sediment, about a mile or more deep. How could a local floodplains or a series of uh, anything form something like that? The Tibetan Plateau, 750,000 square miles of sediment, now at an average elevation of 13,000 feet. Now, mm -hmm. are you going to bring a bunch of uh, local streams to form that sediment? Well, I think there is much evidence, and the, the vast coal deposits that we have. Our uh, geologist, Dr. Steve Austin, whose Ph.D. thesis at Penn State was on the origin of coal. He says one of the greatest evidence for catastrophe on a vast scale is the very existence of coal. No place on this earth today do you find one ounce of coal forming. No place on this earth today. And yet we have millions and billions of tons of coal. Seems to de demand a vast catastrophe. So I say yes, if you ask me yes, there is much evidence for such a, a vast flood. Now, who could prove it's worldwide? No, it can't be done. But there's much evidence for catastrophism on a vast scale. That, that's what we can say. Time. It's not I relevant can, to the discussion anyhow. Um, I can prove that the surface of the Earth is formed in plates. And I can prove that those plates are in motion. And I can demonstrate, at least physically, how it is possible for the Tibetan Plateau to be formed and the Permian uplift. Those of you who, those of you who have looked at the maps of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge will probably also know that direct measurements have been made of the motion of the plates relative to the distant galaxies. Three days ago, I came back from the VLA in New Mexico, the largest radio telescope in the world, where they are continually performing this experiment of measuring the motion of the North American plate relative to the rotational pole of the Earth that, and relative to the fixed stars. That motion has been seen. We know the substructure of the continents. It is inconsistent with any, quote, prediction, unquote, of a global aqueous catastrophe. Plate tectonics was a natural outgrowth of the evolutionary realization of the antiquity of the Earth and provides a physically acceptable, unified view which contains within it predictions which can be tested and used. I think that qualifies as science 
and the idea of a Noahan flood does not. Well, Dr. Shore, you see what he just said? All this data marvelously working together, coordinated in a beautiful scientific way within this concept of continental drift has proven this and proven that and disproven this. Are you aware of the fact that 25 or 30 years ago, there were very few geologists in this entire world who accepted continental drift? Yeah. yeah. They said all that beautiful, marvelous data that you just referred to as explaining everything proved that the continents have always been right where they are now and disproved continental drift. Now you say they take that same data and beautifully prove continental drift. There seems to be something wrong here. They've done a complete flip-flop. How can you so take... So is the, the magnetic field. How can you take the same... Well, wait a minute. All right, you got the magnetic data. I'm very aware. I'm most aware of the magnetic data, Dr. Shore. But you still got that same old data, all that tremendous wealth of data that proved the continents were right where they are now, always have been. That data is still there, same data. The new data is the magnetic data. And you ought to be aware, by the way, in 1979 in Science, there was an article on deep crustal drilling. Now, in that original magnetic data, the anomalies, they took a magnetometer, towed it just above the bottom of the ocean, and they measured the so-called magnetic anomalies. Now they have actually drilled down to the crust of the ocean, and they have measured the magnetic properties of that core, and it doesn't come out at all like they predict on the basis of this theory because in one single core material that would have come out of the earth at one time and should all be magnetized in the same direction was magnetized in three different directions down to 170 meters it would magnetize in this direction for the next 50 meters in that direction and below that in that direction one single lithologic unit one single core and the authors, as a matter of fact, said it was very difficult to understand that, how these magnetic uh, anomalies arose. Thank you, Dr. Gessier. Time's up, and you have one opportunity to read. Uh, if you'd read a little bit further in that paper, you would have seen that they, in fact, were able to infer what the layering structure was from that reversal in the magnetic field. I should just point out that the magnetic field data was not known 25 or 30 years ago because I... I got interested in geophysics when people started to realize that plate tectonics was possible. The evidence that indicated that the continents were static was not inexplicable with continental drift, and the things that had defeated that model were immediately understandable. The existence of the San Andreas Fault, transform faults, the structure of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the variation of the pole of the Earth, the fact that the earthquakes tend to occur along plate margins, the existence of volcanism, the so-called ring of fire, the existence of the variations and the abundances of the rare earths in mid-continental craton, the microplate structure under California. How long do I have to go on? All of these things had completely defeated those theorists who had tried to understand them in terms of the static earth. Except, of course, the Russians, who still think of the thing as just going up and down. But even they're coming around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's some water right there. We're talking about the global aqueous catastrophe. Okay. Good. Let's see. I believe um, Dr. Gish, you is that? It's, it's your turn. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Shore, according to the cosmological principle, based upon the Big Bang suggest the universe should be homogeneous. That's the cosmological principle. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, in the 1980, in Scientific American, an article was published in which the author said that this cosmological principle is a powerful principle. Well, in the last year or two, we found that the universe is not homogeneous at all. We found this massive supercluster of galaxies where a very significant portion of the mass of the universe is in this supercluster of galaxies. We found a huge void in space, 300 million light years across. The universe is not homogeneous at all. How do you reconcile that with the Big Bang Theory? I'm afraid you weren't listening. I did. Uh, the holes are randomly distributed. Uh, Melot 
Zeldovich, Carter, Carr, have all produced, and Novikov, have all produced a series of models using the second law and ordinary gravitation that show that in the expanding background you get these clumps. Now, all I can assert is, I don't like repeating myself, all I can do is repeat what I said before. The distribution of the holes and strings are random. It's only small scale order. Of course, if you look at the biomass in this room, you're a rather trivial mass compared with that of the galaxy, no matter how much I as a human care about the fact that you were also humans. We are a very small fraction of the universal mass. And therefore, the small complexity and order that our bodies represent is rather trivial compared with the input from the universe as a whole. Now, if you look at the distribution of that small scale order on the large galaxy scale, what you would be saying is this boogeyman of the cosmological principle should say that those holes should have a direction in space. There should be very specific distributions of them. And that's not what we find. Kirshner and Omer have done this carefully. My own colleagues at Case Western Reserve have done this carefully. Steve Gregory at Bowling Green has done this. All of these studies show that the distribution is completely consistent with a random structure, and even randomness can have holes in it, sir. Well, you, this universe, the motion in it is not random. You have galaxies, you have clusters of galaxies in angular motion. The Big Bang puts out everything into radial motion. If you're going to take the mass in a galaxy or the mass in a cluster of galaxies and make it rotate, angular momentum is conserved. You must have an adequate cause to cause that material to rotate. Mm -hmm. Now, would you tell me what from this explosion caused that massive amount of material to rotate? Uh, may I have our moderator, please? Come here. I, I need to do this. Please. <laughs> Now, do it with an explosion. I'm going to. Uh, could you just start walking, please? Hold out your arm like this, OK? Thank you. Um, there was rotation. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Dr. Gish, what? that's a torque. What? Two bodies which are self-gravitating can torque each other and keep spinning. Now, I have to stand up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what was the adequate cause, Dr. Shore. He is what caused him to rotate. <laughs> Dr. Shore, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Shore has just proved my point. If, if Doug Brown goes out there, he's not going to rotate unless somebody, some force, makes him rotate. Oh. Lights out, and please. And so you are the adequate cause. You have two minutes. There is a rising stream caused by combustion in a random medium. You see the vortices that are being created, Dr. Gish? That's rotation. Dr. Shore, that's nonsense, and you know it's nonsense. You're not, you're not, you're not going to generate the order in this universe from disorder. And that's what you're saying. This universe is a highly ordered, highly complex, highly structured universe. And to say that we're going to generate that order from disorder is just sheer nonsense. You, it never happens in the real world. And it can happen theoretically. To say so doesn't make it happen. To I'm say not so doesn't make it not happen. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interject in here. We'll have to stop well, on that I'm, question. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry. This, just, this is Dr. just fairy tales. That's okay. all it is. We have uh, the ball's back in your court, Dr. Shore. And due to the time, we have, we'll limit this. This is the last set of questions. The last question, last um, rebuttal. Um, if Dr. Gish wants. Um, I, I would just as soon address this to the audience. It's getting late. It's getting very late. 
<laughs> Later than you think. Did he want to close? May I? Is he? You would like to close? Would you? Today? You would like to close now? Uh, may May I uh, just sum up? That'd be fine. Two minutes. Sure. Two minute summary. You've sat through a great deal, for which I thank you. I, I'm not saying that what I've told you should have the stamp of truth, just honesty. As those of you who are leaving leave, let me leave you with one thought. It is better to have a question to ask than an answer which closes all questions. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Shore, as you have heard him state tonight, evolution is a fact. A fact. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to ask you, is that an example of open-minded science? <laughs> that is not holding a theory tentatively. It is not being open-minded. It is being extremely dogmatic. I know that the general public, or at least many, feel that creationists are dogmatic. Ladies and gentlemen, I have presented my case tonight on the basis of the best science which I am capable of understanding. The fossil record. The fossil record. The science of thermodynamics, which makes evolution impossible. The laws of probability. If you take information content of a living cell and apply the laws of, inf uh, uh, laws of probability that it's impossible to get that thing by chance, by the laws of physics and chemistry. Now, all we are doing here, all we are pleading is that we want this sort of thing that you've seen here tonight, we want our students to have the opportunity to see and hear something similar to this so they can decide for themselves which seems to be more credible and reasonable creation or evolution. And that's all we're asking for. And again, let me repeat, and I'll say it again, that as far as I can determine, and thousands of other scientists have reached this conclusion, and thousands or more are jo joining them, that the best scientific evidence demands creation. And creation, therefore, is credible, reasonable, and we believe a far better explanation than the speculations that we see coming out of the evolutionary camp. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gish. We want to thank you very much for participating and witnessing this debate tonight. As you leave, make sure that you take your surveys and hand them into the ushers as you're going out. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Thank you, Dr. Shore, and thank you, Dr. Gish.